Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And uh, I thought it would be fun to show you today, Kevin, an unknown case. Okay. You don't know anything about this case. No. Uh, I'll tell you one piece of history. What do you want? You only get to choose one piece of history. I need age and gender. Age and gender. That's probably a good choice because... You can predict the radiology based on the pathology yeah, of cancer. Yeah, I, I don't need the radiology. Right. Okay, age and gender, 25 years old. Huge. Woo. And the gender, male. Yeah, 25-year-old man. 25-year-old man. And it ain't a car accident. This doesn't look like a car. I mean, that'd be an autopsy probably, but yeah. this doesn't look like a car accident to me. So this is a 25-year-old man, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Okay. So, a 25-year-old man who gets to a lung biopsy raises a whole... A, a <laughs> surgical wedge biopsy. Yeah, no I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Older patients, you know, you've got a broad spectrum of things you can consider. Younger patients, you, you, you have a limited number of things to consider, especially a young man. And when I look at this lung biopsy, what I'm seeing is nodular disease that looks airway-centered. I can say that without having gone, gone to high magnification, because I can see that there are airways and arteries in association with these nodules. Not perfect in every nodule, but you don't need that. You look around, you count 10 nodules, and you ask, how many could I see airway epithelium in? And it's going to be 80%, 70% here. So, so before we go to any higher power, what would you predict the high-resolution CT scan looked like in this case? Uh, i got to think this is central lobular nodules. Uh, tree and bud. Uh, diffuse bilateral. Diffuse bilateral. Central lobular nodules. Yep. Like real clear cut nodules or kind of some vague nodules? I think halfway between vague and clear cut. So kind of middle of the road. Not super fuzzy like you see in hypersensitivity right, pneumonitis. But not crisp like not silicosis. Crisp like silicosis or sarcoidosis. Right. Right? Yeah. And I, I would think that because these are all airway centered for the most part, of, I believe, uh, I would think this is going to be mid and upper lung zone. Well, that's that's amazing because you just told us what the radiology looked like in this case. Well, it's not magic. Diffuse bilateral nodules, mid and upper lung zone predominant. Yeah. Some of them vague and fuzzy. Other ones more confluent and more um, consolidated. Right. But small nodules. Yeah. Interesting. So under five millimeters. Interesting CT pattern for yeah. a young man. Yeah. So what things would you think about in this category? I mean, sarcoidosis would be a consideration, but they didn't say the word perilymphatic. Mm -mm. And I'm not seeing it and, really plural-based. And the plura is pristine in this case. Okay. So, nodules of the airway, I mean, you if you told me it was immunocompromised, yeah. No, you got to consider you, infection. You know, infection, infection to get to lung biopsy in a young patient is very unusual unless they're immunocompromised. So, right. I mean, if, if you're just off the street... Why would you be getting lung, uh, surgical lung biopsy for nodular airway center disease? And it's got to be something that you're being exposed to. Exactly. So I'm thinking this is an inhalational problem. I'm thinking about uh, somebody who's got opioid abuse who's aspirating in occult fashion, could give you beautiful airway centered inflammatory nodules. I'm thinking something inhalational, like somebody who's had a toxic inhalation. You know, um, recurrent exposure to something by inhalation could do this. It doesn't look like hypersensitivity to me, just at low mag. It's too crisp. The it's nodules crisp. are too crisp for hypersensitivity. And there's not much alveolitis around it, which is what gives you the fuzziness. Right. Remember, hypersensitivity is a more a blue biopsy alveolitis problem than it is a granulomatous problem. So you don't get these distinct nodules. You get these vague nodules from low power. So are you ready to see what the nodules are? Yeah. All right. Here we go. We'll go to this first airway. Wow. Oh, it's cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Yeah, or or let's go back further. Let's go to BOOP. Because okay, BOOP good. used to be described or as... BIP. Or BIP. Or <laughs> BIP. Uh, polyps of organization in the terminal air spaces and in the surrounding lung. So that, that picture of BOOP, if you will, or BIP, or now cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, is a very characteristic one. This looks to me very dramatically endobronchial. So the yeah. injury looks to me like it started in the airway, as opposed to some 
organizing pneumonia patterns are more diffuse around the airways, even if they're inhalational. This looks very discreet. Look at this case. You're following the yellow brick road, and then all of a sudden, it's like, boom. Where done. in the heck did the airway even go here? And I tell you my theory on this. I think the lung uses organizing pneumonia as a defense mechanism. So if the organizing polyps are mainly endobronchial, it's telling you... And they're plugging the endobronchial region. They're protecting the lung from something that came in through the airway. The airway gets damaged. The epithelium gets breached. The fibroblasts migrate in and make a polyp in order to protect the more distal lung from further insult. Classic example... Smoke inhalation firemen, firewomen, aspiration injury. Yeah. It's like the lung says no. More proximal in the bronchioles and not reaching those distal terminal alveoli. Right. And in fact, if we look at the distal terminal alveoli, no. maybe a little bit jazzed up, but not horrible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'll show you a couple of other airways and then we'll talk about what you might think about this case. Here's another one, effaced, half of it is totally effaced, and this right. has what? Wow, look at that fibrin. So this is something that's ongoing. This isn't just 10 days ago, this is also today. Right, so an acute fibrinous and airway organizing center, airway, airway center process. Injury. And there's starting to be a little bit of remodeling here. Yep, so it's been going on for months, because it takes a month to get peribronchial metaplasia of that, of that complexity. Here's wow. another. Look I at mean, that. Look at, this. Look, look at that. Wait, wait, what do you see here? That's gone. There's an artery, and then right next to it, there should be a bronchial. See the smooth muscle? So that that's an artery. Is gone. I mean, the epithelium is gone. It's replaced by fibrin and repair. Right. So Kevin's pointing out this smooth muscle here of the airway, and this is where the lumen should be. Instead, it's just a wad of fibrin with all of this organization. And what do you think about the inflammation? Like, if this was infection, You'd expect a lot more inflammation. It's a lot kind more of acute. Yeah. It's kind of posse cellular yeah. with regard to the inflammation. So you're thinking a chemical injury. What do you think about these macrophages here? They look like smokers type. Kind of dirty. Yeah. A little bit of pigment in them. Some vacuolation within them. Now let me ask you this: Are there any histologic features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia in this biopsy? No. Absolutely not. No, there's vacuoles, but I think they're, they're nitrogen bubbles. Right, there's vacuoles here, but there are absolutely no features of exogenous lipoid pneumonia in this biopsy. I don't see them. You have to have at least one giant cell to make that diagnosis, by the way. For sure. And you should get a macrophage with bubbles. multiple lipid droplets yeah. of varying size. Right. Some should be bigger than the nucleus, yeah. at least. But see all those little bubbles of varying size in the parenchyma? That gets misinterpreted as lipoid pneumonia. So yeah, that's just nitrogen yeah. off-gassing. Yeah. yeah. So we have this injury here. Right. 25-year-old man, airway center distinctly, acute-looking injury. But chronic Fibrin, also. with some chronicity in the background. Fibrin, organizing pneumonia. Your number one consideration is? Inhalational injury. Inhalational injury. And that's exactly what this case is. This is a case of vaping associated acute lung injury. Cool. What the, so C the, what the CDC would call E Valley, electronic cigarette or vaping product associated lung. acute lung injury. E Valley. Wow. Leave it to them to make up a. It's a mouthful. Another another acronym that's acronym that's. It's definitely a mouthful, but this is one of the cases uh, from this past summer. Oh, this, you guys had that in this like, outbreak, like the largest series, right? Seventeen cases. Cool. This is one of those cases, to see one. and this represents what you would expect from inhalation of a toxic chemical right. that destroys the terminal airways. Right. So, what do you think is going to happen to this patient? Um, what are the consequences of this kind of injury? We don't know what the long-term consequences of this kind of injury are. However, you and I both would predict that patients who were not fatally injured are going to have a significant component of chronic small airways disease, perhaps presenting like constrictive bronchiolitis yeah, a bit later disease. in their lives. Terrible disease. So, so it's vaping lung, that, that's, vape that's, lung. A, that's a great case. case of vape lung. So, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what your impression of the oil red O staining is on these cases. Our impression is don't do it.
under any circumstance because we don't think it's helpful. But let us know, and uh, we appreciate you uh, watching. Don't forget to like and comment below. Thanks.